You should be able. Okay. Okay. Um, let me. Okay, let me start here. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, we have a chat room and I hope you know how to use it. And if you have any questions for Dan, uh, put it in the chat room and, and we'll answer them at the end of this presentation. Okay, I'm actually gonna, um, I was gonna do an overview of our website, but I'm gonna save that till later. Let me just get into the presentation here. Uh, that I wanted to explain a little bit about this. Um, I'm, I'm trying something uh, new this time, which is going to be primarily all videos. And normally, uh, videos don't really work that well on Zoom. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Have people got turned off their mics? Life and Ed. Pardon? Yeah, Life and Ed have theirs, and on Elaine trying it. Mm -hmm. Muted. Yeah. If you can turn off your mics, it'd help. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a, just a short PowerPoint to begin with, and then I've got two um, videos of Malheur. And uh, if that if we have time um, at the end, I have a, a short video on um, Dippers at uh, Flaming Geyser. So we'll see how that works. So uh, for Malheur, I I don't know if I've seen shown this before, but these are some shots from Google Earth. And just to show you where Malheur Lake is here, and and uh, primarily where I spent most of the time was around the visitor center here, and I'll show you a close up of that. Um, I've got a lot of photos also from the field station here, and then I've got a few up here on uh, the south end of uh, the Burns Hines area, and this uh, south section of this is called Greenhouse Lane, and we've got a number of photos around in that area also. So to show you an example here, this this uh, this Google Earth view is from 2020, and the lake is fairly well dried up. Then there was still some of it visible, um, but this past year it was even drier than than 2020. And I don't have a a 21 shot, but pretty much the lake completely dried up this year. And this turned out to be I've been going to Melier for like the last 15 years. And this is probably, in terms of wildlife, it's probably the worst it's ever been. I, I would guesstimate that there was only about 10% of the birds that have been there, there in, in other years. And uh, it may be because I was a little late. I didn't get there till the middle of April instead of the 1st of April. So I may have missed a lot of it. But in general, I still think it was, um, it was a lot fewer stuff than normal. Um, so a couple of the shots here, this is what it looked like in 2010. So you can see there was quite a bit more water in it then. And this green area between Burns and Hines and the lake, that's where the Sylvie's River comes in from the north and tends to feed the lake. And it's also where the, the farmers in this area flood their fields from the Sylvie's River. And uh, another view here in 2011, it got a lot wider. This was the best year or the most water of any year that I've been going there. And it also had the most birds. When the, when the lake gets this big, it has almost an order of magnitude more birds than normal in the area. And if you go back to 1984, this is the largest the lake's been in recorded history. And it was so large at that time, it wiped out the roads in this area and the main road through here, it wiped out the railroad that went into Burns and so on. And it actually changed the whole nature of the lake. And that's kind of another story I won't go into at this point, but um, I've got another view here. This is a view of, of the visitor center. And I wanted to show you this. Um, this is where the refuge headquarters is here. They have a visitor center. The friends of Malheur, who I was volunteering and working with, they have a, their own store here. And then there's a, this is called Marshall Pond, and there's a, there's a little trail you can walk around here to see some of the wildlife in the area. <clears throat> Where I stayed was at the trailer court over in this area, and that was all rebuilt uh, a couple of years ago. They have new restrooms and a, uh, a kitchen area and so on here, so it's a really nice place to stay, and you get to be around here late at night when nobody else is here. 
couple other shots. This is this is again from Google Earth and looking kind of out on the lake. So here's the this is the Blitzen River, which comes in from the south and and feeds uh, the the uh, Marshall Pond. And then there's the road here, which is where the trailer, trailer court is. And you can take, do a, a two mile walk out to the Blitzen River here where they let their, um, they put in their jet boats when they want to go out on, on the lake itself. And that's kind of pretty much what it looked like in 2020. Um, their view again in 1985, it came right up to the shores of the visitor center. And I actually found a, I'm still getting a lot of feedback noise. I think um, Elaine Chung has got their speaker on, if you can turn it off. Um, so anyway, so this is a photo I found in ar around the, the area, and this was taken in actually in 1984, uh, and it shows you the, how big the lake was then. Uh, it pretty well closed everything down. In fact, it closed the road coming in from the uh, from the west to uh, to the visitor center. So you had to go all the way around the lake um, quite a ways to get get to the visitor center at that time. So I think that's uh, oh, one more map. This again shows you the refuge visitor center here, uh, the road up to Burns here. And um, this is the CPR road, which is a one lane road that goes through the middle of the refuge. So at that, at that point, I'm going to, um, I'm still getting a lot of feedback. <laughs> People, please turn off your uh, microphones. I, I think everyone's muted, Dan. Uh, well, Sue I'm getting Cooper. feedback. Sue Cooper. Sue Cooper. Looks like she's got her thing on. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do a new share now of my video. Um, this will be part one. Okay, so. We'll start this year. And it, as again, I um, one of the reasons that there weren't as many birds this year was because there was very little runoff from the uh, from the visitors or from the Sylvie's River, and the the, the uh, I lost it. So, um, so the farmers, the, the flooding of the fields didn't start till almost the middle of, of April, and um, and when I got there, this was this was April twentieth. This was the only large flock of soybeans that I saw when I was there. Um, now, again, because I didn't get there in the middle of April, maybe I missed some, but I don't think, as I said, they didn't even start flooding their fields till the, till the, till uh, the middle of April. That that's flock of snow geese left the next day, and we didn't see any more after that. <clears throat> this is a view of my first um, on the way to the the Malheur, uh, refuge. You could run into these kind of roadblocks quite often in the area. It's kind of fun, but it can be kind of smelly. So here's a view. I, I was um, when I was there. I was trying to get up for sunrise almost every morning, and this is a view from uh, just above the visitor center. Um, early morning sunrise. I kept. It's not a really great scene because there's not a lot of um, lot to see there. But the 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 trailer court where I was staying is just below the uh, the telephone pole. You see the power pole. You see in the middle is just below it to the left of that. And the refuge headquarters is to the left side of the screen. I don't have a way of making a pointer on this video now. <clears throat> but, and you can barely see the lake in the distance there. And again, this was the 1985 view. So when you get up early in the morning, there's a herd of mule deer that seems to hang around near the entrance of the, the refuge. So I got a few shots of them. And 
And this is a, a ways, just a, a mile or so down the CPR. You, you could run into a mule deer down there quite often. In the distance, you see the foothills of uh, Steens Mountain with lots of snow on it. We had some pretty frosty mornings. They do a lot of grazing in the cattail marshes. Must be some good something good there. And these are pronghorns. One of the best places to see pronghorns is the main road between Burns and the refuge. A lot of wide open prairie there, which is where the kind of country that the pronghorns like. These sandhill cranes, this is a pond just oh, a half a mile or so from the refuge and saw the sandhill cranes there quite often in the morning. But again, these are flooded fields. So um, because of the limited amount of water, there's usually one sandhill crane that, that nests on Green Horse, Greenhouse Lane. This year there were four uh, because it was literally the only place where there was enough water for them to, to kind of have some security. And I show the same nest a couple, two or three times here, just to show you the way that the level of the water changes from day to day, depending on how they're diverting the water into the area. This is a kind of a sunset shot with a couple of trumpeter swans feeding. Yeah, it looked like a tundra, but I don't really think so. <laughs> kind of hard to tell. See, again, you can see how the water fluctuates a lot there. I did see um, last year, I think it was, I saw there were uh, at one point, there were seven tundra swans up by the Burns area. So this is interesting. Like I say, usually there's one nest in this area and it's well hidden in the cattails. Uh, this year, they're, all four of the nests were out in the open. This one had just started this nest like the day before and she was still kind of spooked of the traffic. And again, after they stop the flooding, the fields dry up and the grass starts growing, which makes them more, a bit more vulnerable. This is a fun shot because it's the first uh, photo I've ever gotten of an egg roll. And again, you can see how the water changes there. These are the greater um, sand hills, and there's usually there's around 300 of them so that nest in the in the area around here. You quite often find the phalaropes in the uh, along the uh, culverts of the roads, if there's enough water in them or in the flooded fields.
I had to slow that down. See it again. It's one of the interesting things I find about birds is they seem to live on a different time scale sometimes than we do. Particularly if you watch them flying through the trees. These are one of the most photogenic birds, I think, that we have. And I found this video interesting because if you watch, they kind of alternate the dipping. I don't know if that's intentional or if it's just a coincidence. But... Also, normally when you see the avis sets feeding, they're sweeping their bills. In this, this case, they're just going straight down. Lots of my friends. There are quite a few golden eagles um, in this area, although you don't see them very often. Um, there were two ravens harassing this one, but I couldn't really get a good picture uh, of them and the eagle. And I try quite a treat getting a, uh, I keep trying to get a video of these guys singing, but it never seems to work out. There's usually too much wind or other noise. And the Swayson's hawk has a nest right near Greenhouse Lane. Um, there's also a second nest um, on the road main highway between uh, there, <clears throat> there in Burns. <clears throat> it's a good time of year to find uh, burning owls because the the fields are all short uh, from the cuttings uh, in the last year. the The bad thing is that they they aren't doing anything this time of year. They're just standing there twisting their heads. <laughs> This is about the most action I got out of one. So that's the end of the first video. Uh, I could take any questions or comments if anybody has any. Now I'll go on to the next one. Okay, so this um, this has got a lot of photos from the field station, and this field station was something that was started in the fifties, and a lot of universities did a lot of um, different kinds of studies from here. They did bird surveys, they did archaeological stu studies. Lots of other things. It's kind of run down, but they're in the process of trying to fix it up. They have a museum there, um, a kitchen facility, and so on. But um, there's a lot of interesting critters around here. And so I was there one day and I saw a couple of flickers land on a, a stump. 
And then, and they kind of had a little battle and then they flew off to another stump. So I started taking pictures and this is what I got. These are just a series of still pictures. That's one of my favorite photos right there. So at this point, they've changed places now. The one on the right is the one that was on the left before. <laughs> and he seems the one that me, the one that goes on the attack. That yeah, so I don't know where those broken fe feathers happened or when they happened, but anyway, it was quite a battle. <laughs> so after that, I started wandering around some of the houses, and uh, a lot of these houses have got critters living in them. So he's got a piece of aluminum backing of the insulation, I think, and he's trying to get rid of it. This went on for quite a while. I cut out the middle of it. It would have been a real long video, but. So after all of that, it drops back inside. He looks frustrated. <laughs> Let's 
And then I saw a whole bunch of action on top of one of the power hole poles. There were a couple of uh, kestrels there that were doing something. So I took a whole bunch of pictures. I must have taken over 50 pictures. I had no idea what was going on. And I didn't even look at them until about two months later. And some of this I just found in the last week. But this is kind of interesting. So the, the male here is caught a lizard. And he's presenting it to the female, kind of part of their courtship. And she takes the lizard and then they immediately start their fun. This also went on for quite a while, but I cut a lot of it out. <laughs> Probably the fun parts. So after all that, she still has a lizard. This seems to be one of their favorite foods. It's the only thing I, I saw them catching. I, I was spent quite a bit of time there watching them. Seemed to be the main diet. They were quite a ways away from me. This is a, just the crop of the lower part of the negative for, on, the, on this thing. So I wandered around a little bit more and I found some kestrels uh, with a nest there. And I don't know if they're the same ones. I suspect not because this was the same day, just a little while later. And here the male again is coming with a lizard and he's giving it to the, to the female and she's gonna take it and fly off and eat it. And he's gonna go sit on the nest for a while while she's gone. And it's quite interesting to watch when he tries to pass it to the female, he has to bring it up on his belly and kind of push his belly up towards her so she can get a hold of it. So I actually saw him do this several times and I had it, so it gave me a couple of times to try to get some, some decent shots. And I, and I managed to get this. And then I thought, well, I'll try to do a, a slow motion one of them next time. So I sat there waiting again for two hours for him to come and uh, do it again. And <laughs> when they finally got there, the male, um, this was later on after this happened, but the male came and landed in that same tree, looked at me, then hollered to the female, meet me on the telephone pole. And they flew, they both flew off and they did the food exchange on the telephone pole where I couldn't get a picture of them. So that was, that was May 5th. That was a lot of fun. So nearby there's a barn that has some great horned owls in it. And um, they out, the nest has been there for years and years, but you've never been able to get a picture of it. And in the past year, uh, part of the side of the barn fell off. So I was able to get some uh, pretty nice pictures of the owlets. There are lots of great horned owls around. Almost any place you see uh, a grove of cottonwoods, there's probably an owl nest in it.
So this is a minute and a half, minute and a half of a 10 minute video I took of them. I believe she's got a coot in the nest and they're feeding on the coot. There's quite a difference in size of the owlets. It's, it's interesting to me, there doesn't seem to be a lot of competition for the food. They've got plenty of it. There's no hurry. Everybody's getting well fed. And this is another pair of great horned owls that was at the field station. And this nest is only about six feet off the ground, pretty exposed, um, but they had three owlets there. Um, they, they put a, a ribbon around it and some bear cage to keep people from getting close to it. But, and there's always a bunch of great horned owls at the, at the refuge also. And this is another nest down at Benson Pond, which is about halfway down the uh, CPR road. And a few flight shots of a red-tailed hawk. So there's a red uh, pair of red tails that have a nest at the refuge. Um, they've, they've had the nest there for at least two or three years now. I don't remember if this is the same hawk, but I've got some coming up here with the refuge one. This is the refuge hawk. This is out by Marshall Pond, and he's coming in for a landing. I'm not sure exactly why he lands, and then he takes off immediately. And it could be that he's, he's apparently got a mouse or something in his talons there. And it may have been that he was just trying to get a better grip on it. I'm not sure. And here's another picture of him eating another something or other that he caught. And this is the female on the nest at the refuge. And there's a ferruginous hawk nest. This is on the highway between the, uh, the refuge and Burns. It's been there for years and years. This is, uh, this is what it looked like this year. This is what it looked like in 2018. So it's, it keeps getting bigger and bigger every year.
And so I was, um, why my job at the, as a friends in the mail year was to run the store. And so that was kind of a halftime job. And when there wasn't crowded, I'd go out by Marshall Pond and take, try to get flight shots of warblers, which was kind of fun. And what amazed me is I could actually get pictures of the bugs they were trying to catch. And this is the best one I got. This is my prize photo. This is only a small portion of the of the of the photo. It was severely cropped, but it came out sharp anyway. Kind of neat that you, what you can do to catch things that you can't actually see in in real life. So occasionally you get a rare bird at Melier. Actually, quite frequently you get a, a rare bird, and this is a great-tailed jackal that showed up. Great-tailed grackle, and. Uh, I was sitting out at the picnic shelter eating my lunch one day and I heard something banging behind me and I turned around and this guy was in the dumpster. So they hang they hung around for about two weeks. I think that I think there were two of them, although we never saw the two together actually, but they were around a couple of weeks. And I think this is a um, a juvenile sage grasser. So I took a, a trip down to Steens Mountain, and I'm going down the uh, the east side of the mountain, hoping to get a sunrise shot. This is a a lot of dirt road. It's about a 200 and over 200 mile round trip from the uh, refuge down around the mountain. A lot of it's on dirt road. That's Steens Mountain in the distance. The road is in immaculate condition, even though it's dirt road, they must grade it almost every week. There's a lake here with a small campground at it. And this is the best shot I could get. The clouds were really coming in. So if you don't know, Steens Mountain um, rises from the on the uh, east side, goes straight 5,000 feet straight up. And then on the west side, it tapers down gradually to the, uh, the elevation over there. I took a side trip to Mickey Hot Springs. I'd been there before. And uh, I'd forgotten how far it was in there. I was thinking it was about five miles. It's on a narrow two lane road. I think I'm probably the first Tesla to have visited the spot. Um, it's, it's a gorgeous spot. There were two cattle trucks in there at the same time that were loading uh, cattle to take out. This is the hot springs itself, looking back towards Steens. So anyway, I thought I could do the trip, the 230 mile trip fairly easily because my car is supposed to have 300 mile range, but it turned out I added an extra 34 miles on here. So I was getting nervous. 
If you look closely, you can see the two cattle trucks in the in the uh, on the road, but they're pretty far away. And this is a shot of the Elver Desert. Where's the Elver Desert? Hmm? Where's the Elver Desert? It's just on there, right, right near that same spot. I'll say that. So here we are back at uh, Marshall Pond at sunset with a great egret. And these pictures here were actually taken after sunset. It actually, if you looked over there with your naked eye, you couldn't even see the sand hills there but you can actually take a picture of them and it comes out pretty nice. Marshall Pond dried up completely this year, later on the year. Almost everybody is gone from the refuge at this time of the, of the day, so it's a lot, of, a lot of different animals come out. You can see a muskrat going along in the back here. Occasionally, you'll see a river otter in the pond. And the black neck still. So Marshall Pond is just right about where the sun is there, just to the right of that big tree. So that's pretty much my show of Of the pond, or of the of Malheur. as I said, it was a uh, uh, a very dry year this year. Um, I I don't know, like I say, I, it seems to me about there were only about a tenth of the number of birds normally there. There were probably an order of magnitude more people there than there usual are in, in April. Um, I think it's just because everybody thought COVID was over with and everybody wanted to get out. We were. The store was just absolutely mobbed with people um, at the time. Uh, the Friends of Mail Year membership went from like 300 to 1,300, I think, last year. They had so many visitors and so on. So it was a pretty good year for business. Anybody have any questions, comments? Christine's in the chat. I'd just like to make a quick comment, Dan. Uh, <clears throat> I went there two years ago in July for the express purpose of getting up on top of Skeens Mountain. You can take a road up almost all the way to the summit and it's hot during the day, but the view from the top looking east, south and north and west, amazing, amazing photo. You can see all the way to Idaho, south of Nevada, 
Uh, so not just going in the spring, it's, it's worth going almost all year long down there to see uh, different things. Yeah, you know, even as bad as it was last year, it's still a great place to bird. <laughs> So it's uh, yeah, it's it's a worth worth worthwhile trip there. Um, interesting uh, thing about the carp you mentioned there. There was a field. There were uh, several fish biologists there that have been trying to deal with the carp in the lake and get rid, rid of them. And they were when I was there in April, they were actually trying to tag some of the female carp and then and then try to follow them to see where they went in in the lake. And by doing so, they, they, they had this theory that they would all, a lot of them would meet in a certain spot and then they could maybe go there and try to catch them or poison them or whatever. But by the end of the, by the middle of the summer, the lake had completely dried up. So the whole, the whole thing, <laughs> the whole study went to pot and the guy that was doing the research um, actually quit and went to another place. So um, bad year for research also, I guess. Um, I have I have one more video of flaming uh, dippers at Flaming Geyser. If you'd like to see that, I could show that. Sure, Dan. And then afterwards, uh, uh, skip this over to the website if you can to show okay. what's going on there. Okay. Dan, um, yes. What are the elevations of the lake and of the of um, the mountains there? Oh, the, the elevation is, is runs around 4,500 to 5,000 feet. So it's high desert. Um, and uh, and it's, uh, again, those are basin lakes. So there's like three rivers that flow into Malheur and none that flow out. So it, that's why it varies so much with the, you know, depending on the, pre the precipitation and so on. Well, what's the elevation of the lake? Well, the, the lake is right around somewhere between four and 4,500 feet. Okay, then what's the elevation of the Skeens Mountain? Skeens is 10,000 feet. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it, it rises gradually from the from the west to the east and then drops 5,000 feet straight down to the Alver Desert on the on the east side. That's a lovely trip. It, the, it's a loop road going up the mountain and it has some um, amazing force of... Uh, uh, I forget the name of the tree. Asp, Aspen forests. It's very beautiful. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great place. You usually can't get up the mountain until about August because of the snow, and there's lots of wild horses there also. So let me try this one. This is kind of cool. This is this is only a few weeks old. So this is this was when the salmon started running there pretty late this year. Uh, this like I say, this is only a couple of weeks old, but uh, you'll the dippers are in there with the salmon trying to catch things. These are in slow motion, I think. They're not playing quite as well as I would have liked them. I'll, I'll put them up on uh, my Flickr site in, in a bit. You can watch it a little bit better there. No, that's sounding. Hmm? Was it? Yeah, they're trying to catch either either caddisfly larvae or salmon eggs. What either one? 
or, or any kind of bug they can find, I guess. So here he's trying to break, I, I think this is a caddis fly and he's trying to break it out of its cocoon. Yeah, the resolution isn't as good on this. The speed's too fast, I think. But. So it keeps banging it on the rocks and try to crack it, crack it open. Yeah, I think he finally got it there. <laughs> or maybe not. No, still playing with it. Hey Dan, what's the name of that creek? I think it's Christie Creek or something like that, or Chrissy Creek. And that's right next to the geyser, isn't it? Yeah, it's right next to the geyser. Yeah. This is just uh, there's a bridge there, and this is just below the bridge. There is a salmon egg. Yeah, the video is hanging up a little bit. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, we'll do a quick tour of some things on the website and we'll be done here. Hang on a minute. I can find it. Okay, so I've added a, a number of new things on, the, on here. Uh, we've got lots of different events in the event calendar that you can go to. 
but I, what I've done is I've put, there's categories for different events, so you can filter them. So if you wanted to see what's coming up in terms of program nights, you can hit that uh, menu item there, and it will just show you the, uh, the monthly program nights. So you can see that we've got the next one coming up is Jays on bird migration, and the next one after that is exploring Arctic landscapes landscapes and so on that I, I don't have the information for them any of them beyond that. So the main thing is that there's there's filters for these things. You can find classes and webinars, nature journaling, field trips, and so on. So it's a convenient way of filtering items there. Uh, I've added a, a little thing over here for member photos. We've got a I started to try to put member photos up here, but I think it might be kind of hard to um, to manage that. So what I've done instead is I've created a Flickr website. And if you click on this first photo here on Flickr, it'll take you around on the website, it'll take you to Flickr where we have a Rainier Audubon photo group. And so if this is free, you can sign up on Flickr for free and then you can add photos on this website. So that'll be a way that we can uh, manage that. Uh, the other main thing I wanted to show you here is back on the main thing. If you go to the calendar or any, um, let's go to the main page here. Uh, you can go down here to the bottom of the calendar. And there's a thing here that says subscribe to the calendar. And if you click on that, you can you can put the basically our calendar on your own personal Google Calendar or iCalendar by clicking this. You'll be subscribed, and then when you go to your personal calendar, you'll see all of our events that are on our calendar there, and it'll be updated once a, once a uh, once a day. So that's about all I have. If anybody's got any more questions? Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, tell them about uh, member photos, Dan. I just did. Oh, I wasn't listening. <laughs> um, I put I put other things in here, like for climate change. I've got a bunch bunch of resources you can go see there, and things on clean energy. Uh, the one one thing that I found fairly recently that I find interesting is there's a there's an outfit called. Um, here it goes. This guy here says, uh, what's he called? Um, I forgot what he calls it now. I don't see it. Anyway, he's got a, he's a, it's part of an organization on, on clean energy and so on. And he's got lots of videos that have on different topics of clean energy. So I put links to him here. You can go also go directly to his website for information. And they also, the same organization also has a number of courses. It's called the, the uh, Climate Behavioral Development Solutions. And, and they actually have courses that you can take on climate change and all kinds of different subjects. And it's all free. So it's kind of an interesting resource if you're interested in that. I would also encourage any of you, um, it's... Uh, it's a struggle to keep our organization going with the COVID thing. You know, we, we're not we're not having nearly as member many members at the meetings and so on. Um, but I would encourage you to try to get. We, we're doing a lot of a new stuff, including the new website and things like that. Um, we could use more volunteers. Uh, we could use more. We need some more new people to run for the board this spring and things like that. So, um, if you're interested in, in joining us, we'd appreciate some help. Yes, the president's trying to be treasurer, and I can barely balance a uh, checkbook. Okay, that's it. I'll stop the recording. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, Mal here never ceases to 